Hello folks and welcome to this week's review and well it's about time isn't it? Don't you think? I think so. It's about time that I reviewed a product from the venerable UK hi-fi outfit Graham Slee. So what do we have from Graham Slee today then? Well it's a DAC. It's a DAC called the Majestic. It's priced at 1000 600 pounds, but it's a DAC that does not bend to modern fashion or modern convenience or modern most things, to be honest. So I'll say it again it's a DAC. There is no headphone amplifier built into this chassis, there's no Bluetooth built in. You don't even get those annoying user defined filters. There's nothing else in this box except the DAC. And that's why I'm rather excited to review this one. I'm a bit of a purist at heart, I must admit, in hi-fi terms at least. I like a hi-fi product to do one thing, to do the one thing it's designed to do. I don't like my hi-fi tools to wander off and lose focus. So there's no chance of the Majestic doing that. The next thing that interests me is the DAC chip within. Grainsley has chosen a Wolfson DAC chip. Shock horror, hey, why not a variant of the all-powerful ESS range, you ask? Well, because according to Grainsley himself, if you go ESS, then you're basically looking at a software-driven DAC. The DAC chip rules the roost and it calls the shots. If you drop in a Wolfson, actually, in this case, two Wolfson chips. There's a WM8804, which is a kind of an SP diff transceiver. And then there's the 8741 DAC chip itself. Then you can still have a hardware dominated design, one in which the analog section plays a major part and influences the sound, as we will see later on. Now, some of you have heard my gripes when reviewing DACs with ESS chips within. So, all this information from Graham Slee, well, it puts a smile on my face. Thing is though, and this helps to partly wipe that self-same smile off my face, this particular chip is not long for this world. Back in, what, 2014, Cirrus Logic bought Wolfson as a company, and it's Cirrus Logic, Boo Hiss, that's decided to retire this DAC chip. Now, I don't know if Graham Slee is going to upgrade, as it were, the Majestic in the future with a new chip. I'm not sure. But if we just take the hardware we have in the box right now, the DAC in this review has suddenly become a limited edition. Now, I must say that Graham Slee has bought quite a few of these chips. They are, I have to say, stored in Graham Slee's own lead-lined bomb-proof vault within his own nuclear shelter, buried somewhere near the Bank of England in London, UK. Even so, the supply of these chips is limited. So, after this review, if you fancy one of these units, I would advise you to buy sooner rather than later. They won't be available forever. How long? Well, depends, doesn't it? Depends how many the company sells. Catch-22 and all of that. As for the DAC chip specs, well, you're looking at 24-bit 192 kHz for the coax, 96K for the first optical. There's more than one, and we'll get to that a bit later on. But if you want to upgrade the optical to 192 kilohertz, that's the optical one socket, the first socket. You can do that. Not sure if there's some extra payment up front if you want to do that. I have asked the company, but they were a bit busy when I asked, so I haven't got the answer back just yet. But um, I will post the answer in the comments when I get that back. So there is an option anyway to upgrade the optical. USB, you're looking at 24 bit 48. Kilohertz. Now, before I talk any more techie, you know the routine now, don't you? Because we need to take a closer look. Welcome 
welcome to the Closer Look section for the Graham Slee Majestic DAG. And taking a general look at the Majestic and in its physical form, the aluminium case kind of reminds me of something or someone in company terms. Maybe I'm thinking of Burson. Is that what I'm thinking of? That chunky, almost industrial look? softened a tad, I do have to say, by a sketch of a dove on the front fascia. Is it a dove? Looks like a dove to me. In addition to this fauna, the front fascia also includes toggle switches. I do like a toggle switch. And before we go any further, this particular unit is well used. Now, Graham Slee, not a massive company, can't be throwing out brand new samples here and there to sweaty journalists like myself. So what you're looking at is one that's been around the houses a little bit. Great thing about that is it's well run in. However, one or two of the labels on the front are just a tad worn. So just make allowances for that if you would. Moving from left to right on the front here, we trip over our first toggle switch for USB, turning that on and off. Next is a mute switch. Then there's a rotary source selector. Just to the, what, seven o'clock position of that selector, you'll find a little power light that glows green. Continuing our rightward foray, there's an analog input switch, and then there's the volume rotary knob. So why toggle switches? According to company man John Cadman, he said, and I quote, we much prefer toggle switches as we find them much more reliable than push buttons. Better contact area. There's also that thing that when you push a button in on these lightweight, well, relatively lightweight cases, the entire thing will move back as you push in the button. So you can operate this box one-handed. Finally, push buttons become tarnished internally much faster than toggle switches. So there's that long life thing. You may also notice something missing off the front. If you're familiar with modern DACs, there is no output screen. Now, I don't know about you, but I find this omission strangely refreshing. As Cadman explained to me, and I quote, everything in the Majestic is hardware based, so we did not really want to get involved in screens and software. Also, we prefer the clean look without lots of illumination on the front. But that's not all I have to say. The company are terribly suspicious of screens because they have to be powered somehow, don't they? A screen means there's current floating around in the DAC, which may mean possible leaky current doing terrible things to the sound quality. Again, there's that purity thing going on here. And personally, well, I have no issues with any of that. Oh, and another thing, one that appears on lots of modern DACs, there is no Bluetooth. And let's hear from Mr. Cadman again, shall we? And I quote, Bluetooth is a licensed edition and is incredibly costly for something that's not mass produced. We thought it not worth the expense. Now you may not know, but if you want to have Bluetooth installed in your thing, whether it's an amp or a DAC or whatever it might be, You've got to pay a license. You have to pay Mr. Bluetooth for the privilege. And how much do you have to pay? Well, around £20,000. And that's just for Mr. Bluetooth to take notice and recognise that you exist. If you want to license the actual product itself, there are license fees on top of that. Me? Well, I can personally do without Bluetooth in a DAC mainly because the loss of Bluetooth cuts down on general vibration and high-frequency noise. Thus, not having Bluetooth here should, with a bit of luck, the fingers crossed and the wind travelling in the right direction, help the Sonics. Let's go around the back now, shall we? And we'll start on the left again, and we have a pair of balance ports. 6.35mm TRS balance ports, the original balance format as found in music studios. But why no XLR ports, which is far more common on hi-fi kit? Apparently, space issues. That's why you don't see them. 
But to alleviate that, you can buy converter cables. And I'll be using such cables in this review. In fact, these cables arrived here in two flavors. There was the TRS2 XLR and the TRS2 single ended to give you more flexibility. And I'll be taking advantage of all of that in a moment. Next to those TRS balanced outputs are RCA outputs and inputs. And then you'll see a small DIN socket for an external power supply. I was supplied with the PSU1 power supply brick. There is an upgradable power supply option, but I'm not going to cover it here because of time and space reasons. Now, in the future, there's a strong possibility I might be looking at a Grainsley phono amplifier. And if I do, I will look at the upgraded supply in that product review. So anyway, your DIN cable runs to the brick. And then from there, a standard mains cable runs to the wall, connected using a figure of eight plug. Moving on now, and we hit three, yes, three coax and three optical ports plus a USB-B. Now, three coax and three opticals is a lot. I'm sure you'll agree. So again, why are they there? Well, apparently it's your fault. Well, your fellow hi-fi enthusiasts at any rate. The company was going to insert just the one. Then they decided to tour the hi-fi forums and well, market research kicked in popular demand and all that. Finally, another missing item. There is no remote control with the Majestic. According to Cadman, and I quote, we did not think it necessary. Keeping things much more simple and additional unnecessary clock circuits out, keeping noise down to a minimum. Again, that's really fine with me. This design does appear to prioritize sound quality. And again, it's a purist approach. Now, before we leave the closer look section, I have to say you can do your own sound tests at home with the Grainsley Majestic DAC because the company runs a home loan program. As long as you join the company's own forum, which resides on their website, you are eligible for a home loan on a prospective purchase. Again, I approve more companies should run this sort of thing. This home loan thing is run by volunteers, incidentally. Hi-Fi fans, much like yourself, but Hi-Fi fans who happen to like Graham Slee products. Anything else before we move on? Yes, actually, there is one thing. This unit runs both single-ended mode and balanced mode, as I've just explained. But on my unit, single-ended mode was fixed in terms of gain, while balanced mode was variable. So what does that mean? Well, the volume knob on the front of the Majestic controlled the gain. In single-ended mode, the volume knob on my main amplifier, well, that controlled the gain. Thing is though, you can have either. The choice is yours. That is, when you order this DAC, you can request that single-ended and balanced outputs be either fixed or variable. The choice, as I say, is yours. Also, later on, if you think I've made a horrible mistake, I've just changed my mind, no problem. You can go back to the company and for a nominal sum, you can change it. You can go either way, variable or fixed, not a problem. So enough tech talk. Let's see what this thing actually sounds like, shall we? Welcome to the sound quality tests for the Graham Slee Majestic DAC. And I brought in my Topping D90LE and my EMN Traduto DACs. Do a bit of reference comparison with this. And I know 
Both of those are rather cheaper in price, but well, I wanted to find out if the Majestic was worth the extra cash. Was it worth spending out more money to buy the Majestic? In music terms, I also began with CD. I connected my Audio Lab CD transport to the Majestic just to hear how it coped with CD play. And I began with a CD version of Pete Barden's self-titled album from 1971 on the Transatlantic label. Now, Barden's, if you like your prog, as I do, used to be a member of Camel. And I think this album was produced before he joined or before Camel became a thing. I played the track Write My Name in the Dust, which is more of a blues rock, kind of a proto-prog kind of track. And it features Barden's lead vocal, you get female backing, it's a sort of harmony trio, Hammond organ, the sound I could listen to all day, incidentally, acoustic bass and electric guitars, and percussion. It's a busy soundstage, so there's plenty of opportunities for errors to intrude into the presentation. In addition to that, I also grabbed Ruichi Sakamoto's 1989 album on Virgin called Beauty, and the track Diabaram, which is a rather gentle and fragile vocal piece with low-key strings, percussion, and the like. I began this review in single-ended mode. And my first impression from this DAC, low noise, no treble pinch or mid-range screech, no shiny bass either. Bass, in fact, offered a sense of realism instead of the oft-heard plastic bass effect that you often hear with modern DACs. By that, I mean they offer lots of impact, but no soul in the digital sphere. The Majestic moved away from the one-tone metallic bass effect to provide a more complex suite of lower frequencies. Moving way over to the other extreme and treble and cymbal hits on this track are coated by a phase shifting filter, which is all very early 70s. Hey, this filter can often dominate other DACs that I have heard, but the Majestic reminds the ear that, yes, underneath that suite of effects, there's a real symbol here. The Majestic produced a full, rich symbol response to percussive strikes. More than anything, though, and the most surprising aspect of this DAC in performance terms was that it never sounded like it was making an effort. It never gave me the impression it was trying to impress. I have DACs here that want to do just that, but they often sound overeager. They strain a bit and they offer lots of wow factor, at least initially, but they can become tiresome during long periods of listening. So you get that listening fatigue. And that's the principal and central feature of this DAC. The Majestic is aimed at long term listening. This is a DAC that tries its best to pass on musical information from the source, rather than repackage it with added fireworks. So if you listen to this DAC, you probably won't be impressed, actually, at least initially, but give this one time and you'll hear how at ease the music sounds. Music flows with little efforts from the Majestic. There's a genuine organic aspect to the playback here. Sure, if your recording is bright and nasty, then the Majestic won't hide the fact, but it certainly won't make things any worse. What it will do is pass the music from the source to your ears in as balanced way as possible. Frankly, the more I listened to the Majestic in single-ended mode, the better it sounded. That is, rather than throwing music at you, the Majestic kind of invited you to come to it. And this is why the Majestic sounded better than the cheaper Topping and EMN DAX. No surprise, really. It's a much more expensive DAC. You would have expected that, but I can confirm that is true. All those sonic highlights I've just mentioned, well, they were over and above what the Traduto and the Topping DAX were providing. Now, at this point, I wondered what balance play might sound like compared to single-ended mode. So I changed a few cables. I decided to ignore my preamp. I have a separate preamp. I have a preamp and I have a pair of monoblock power amps. And by the way, if you want to see these monoblock power amps 
closer up, they are Valve based, produced by Icon Audio in the UK. If you want to see them in action, close up, as it were, then you can. They feature in part four of my Hi Fi tour, which is on my Patreon page right now. Exclusive. I'll put details below. Anyway, I decided to plug in my Majestic DAC directly, directly to these monoblocks. I took the preamp out of the system. So, because the Majestic has a little preamp of its own built into the chassis, I didn't need the big major reference preamp. So, Gramsley DAC straight to my power amp. I also thought I'd do this because balance mode on my DAC, as I say, offered variable gain. That is, I could run the DAC, as I say, via the Majestic's own built-in preamp. Now, connecting the Majestic's balance ports directly to my power amps required these converter cables I mentioned earlier on. So what did the Majestic sound like in this direct mode? Well, once again, the noise floor dropped a lot. The soundstage sounded clear transparent and actually offered a real 3D effect in terms of how the instruments were structured around the soundstage. You felt really that you could walk into the soundstage and move around because that front to back effect was very impressive. Midrange was very informative and quite well majestic. Well, I had to say at some point in this review, hey. Tonal realism was further increased. The instruments sounded solid they had form, there was space between each and every one of them, and all that meant that subtle sounds were easier to locate by the ear. Hence, there was more finesse, there was more elegance in and around the soundstage. Next, while I moved on a little bit further, I decided to go back to my earlier configuration, back to single-ended mode, and in came my preamp once more. But this time, Instead of the CD transport, I connected my Astell & Kern Can Alpha Digital Audio Player to the optical port, and then I listened to the Dove's Universal Want from the album of the same name. And I also compared the Majestic with my higher-end benchmark DAC, which was, well, when I grabbed it, it was valued at around £3,000. The result? Well, the Majestic was rather lovely. In fact, in many respects, I preferred it to the benchmark in terms of mid-range realism, the structured and spacious soundstage, and that 3D effect of those instruments on show. Again, an open, airy mid-range with enough detail, subtlety, and delicacy on offer to allow vocals to plug in to the emotion of the song. Bass was full of impact. Plus, that naturalistic bounce and energy to help the lower frequencies to groove in extremis. Finally, I plugged in my laptop into the USB B port and I ran the police's message in a bottle. And I played that through the Audiovana Plus software player. Here, from the Majestic, percussion was rock solid with a firm rhythmic foundation. Vocals were smooth, yet passionate, while the guitar twanged with some gusto. So how do I conclude this review of the Graham Sleet Majestic DAC? Well, let me give you some final thoughts. We'll do some pros and cons, and then I'll give you a rating. Graham Majestic DAC is a product of independent thought. It's not a Me Too design, and I see a lot of Me Too designs. Quick and dirty DAC designs to make quick and dirty profits from quick and dirty fly-by-night companies. Not this box, though. I said the Majestic was a design for purists, and I ain't kidding. It focuses on the essentials. It removes the fluff and the detritus. And the sonic result is a delight. It provides the features you need. It 
dumps the features you don't, which means you pay the price for the job in hand. You don't pay good money for mere trinkets. It's been a long time since I reviewed a real world hi fi DAC product for a real world audience at a sensible price that does the job and no more. It's also been a long time since I've heard a DAC that sounded less than digital. In short, the Graham C Majestic DAC is a sound tool, it's not a fashion item. And I love it for that. Let's talk pros and cons. In the good section, well, I love the back to basics design. No Bluetooth, no headphone amp, no screen. I think all of this actually helps the sound. Next, the build quality. This is a chunky chassis with chunky controls. You get the feeling these controls are gonna last forever. In terms of what I want a DAC to do, or that I need a DAC for, all of the features I want are present in the Majestic. Overall sound quality. Well, you've heard what I've said in the sound quality tests. I love the sound of this thing. It was just wonderful. And in the bad section, absolutely nothing at all. Which is why I'm going to give this wonderful DAC a wonderful rating, an award winning rating, a deeply groovy 9 out of 10. Congratulations to Graham Slee. And that's it folks, thank you very much for staying to the end of this video, and I should have said this at the beginning, shouldn't I? But down in the description there are chapter headings if you want to navigate around this video. There's also a host of links to my Patreon page, which I mentioned earlier on, it has the hi-fi tour I mentioned, but also other unique items. You'll also be able to see all my videos early, a few days before it appears on my channel. It'll appear on the Patreon page. It's a bit of a hub now, so all my work goes on Patreon. So that means everything I do on YouTube, everything I do on my website, everything I do on my social media platforms. You don't have to go scouting. Just check it all out on my Patreon page. It's all there. In addition, there are links to my website, all those social media platforms I've just mentioned, including my Facebook group, which you're welcome to join. Ah! Oh, I forgot to ask, down below, <laughs> should have said this first, hey? Down below, if, if it's okay with you, if you could click on the like and subscribe buttons, please. I should have said that earlier. Oh, I don't know. Anyway, if you can, just down there, it would help the old algorithm, YouTube thing, uh, helps the channel to grow. And that's about it, really. I will be... Is there anything else? No, that's about it. I will be back on... My voice is going... I'll be back on Friday with a Hi-Fi News Etc. Full of strange bits and oddments and things. Not quite sure because the format is quite fluid. It depends what comes in, you know? Tell me, incidentally, because the Friday videos have been a bit here and there. Which bits are your favourites? Which bits do you like? And popular demand and all that, I will make sure they're in. I know you love the trivia question, for example, so that'll always be there. Anyway, I hope to see you on Friday, and then there'll be another review the following Sunday, and on we go. Until that time, folks, bye-bye for now.